me, I'll always say what I feel. In this episode, we'll be discussing surveillance, secrecy, Julian Assange and democracy. You have the right to be what you are and say what you think, because here we have personal freedom, we have liberty. And these are not just fancy words. We must guard everyone's liberty, or we can lose our own. We'll be reviewing We Steal Secrets by Alex Gibney, The Assange Agenda by Michael Weatherhead, and Secrecy by Peter Gallison and Rob Moss. The official account was going to be the only thing out there, was going to stand as truth in the public record, and it was not true. The influence of the uh, military-industrial national security state, particularly since 9-11, is to me at least disturbing, and uh, I would even say frightening. Welcome to Hotspots, the global current affairs and documentary review show that brings you the deeper issues behind today's headlines. My name is Lucy Rhodes. Later in the show, I'll be joined by fellow film reviewer Simon Foster and the makers of Secrecy, Professor Peter Gallison and Rob Moss. Some call him a hero. Some see him as a threat to national security. Julian, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I talked to the man behind the leaks. Julian Assange. Julian Assange. Mr. Assange, good morning to you. What have the leaks achieved? We have published more classified documents than the rest of the world press combined. So it's journalistic. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm fond of the phrase, uh, lights on, rats out. Do you feel you have accomplished what you wanted to with the release of these documents? Not yet. Assange has polarized much mainstream opinion with his revolutionary and abrasive attack on the status quo. But love or hate him, the one-time hacker dubbed the most dangerous man in the world and his new WikiLeaks political party have brought the issues of transparency and accountability into the political spotlight. With Edward Snowden's revelations about secret service surveillance of the internet on a mass scale via corporate entities like Google and Facebook, the world has begun to ask questions about how technology is affecting the democratic power and civil rights of Western democracies across the world. Julian Assange was obsessed with secrets, keeping his own and unlocking those of governments and corporations. The internet is not a good place for secrets. Our first film is We Steal Secrets. With all the controversy around Australia's preeminent hacktivist, Julian Assange, it was a sure bet that We Steal Secrets would raise some ire and some interest. What's clear about him is he became a public figure extraordinarily quickly. It was really April 2010 where he went from relative obscurity into an absolutely central world figure. And he did it deliberately. I mean, he, he knew what he was doing. He decides to take on the American state in public. Gibney carefully traces the rise of Julian Assange to prominence from teenage hacker to internet activist and transparency advocate, threading together an impressive narrative from the disparate facts, news headlines and colourful takes that Assange has racked up from his hacking days to forming WikiLeaks in 2006. His thinking is, how can we destroy corruption? It's a whistleblower. Julian Assange is neither a right-wing libertarian nor a standard leftist. I think he's a humanitarian anarchist, a kind of John Lennon-like revolutionary dreaming of a better world. If we are to produce a more civilized society, a more just society, it has to be based upon the truth. This film shows the unwavering commitment of Assange's aim to radically shift regime behavior. This film is not a consistently positive portrayal of Julian and WikiLeaks, but it is a good history of the maturation of a young Assange into the man who pioneered WikiLeaks and how he has since sought asylum to escape extradition to Sweden and potential political persecution and is now entering the realm of mainstream politics. Stephen Gray for Channel 4 Thanks, News. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks. You know, every fucking gun pointed at me. Joining me to review these films is Simon Foster, a freelance film reviewer and feature writer. 
What did you think of this film? Well, I'm a huge Alex Gibney fan. The director uh, I was fortunate enough to speak to for his last film, Mia Maxima Culpa, and he's a, a filmmaker who's not only an accomplished visual artist, his films look great, uh, but he's very, very heavily embedded in the world of journalism, of, uh, of, of research and formulating very knowledgeable arguments about his subjects, and he's done that with, with We Steal Secrets. He's very prolific. He turns out a lot of movies. I think he made like four documentaries just through 2012, this being his latest. Um, and the mountains of uh, information that he's sort of collated and, and, and formed into a, a very coherent, very passionate film um, is remarkable. It was kind of the new Mick Jagger. Yeah. I'm really, really. Groupies, stalkers, media, everyone had big interest in Julian at the time. And he liked it. He liked it. <laughs> of course. Some people have been critical of the film because of seeing Julian Assange on the dance floor, seeing Julian Assange in the light of uh, these allegations for, from women in Sweden around, you know, having sex with a, a broken condom. I came to the end of the film and wasn't completely sure that this was a, a positive portrait of, of Julian. What, what did you feel about that? It may not have cast that great a, a spotlight on, on some of the more salacious angles of his existence and, and some, of the, um, some of the stuff he's gotten up to, uh, but it was certainly a film, um, and Gibney specialises in this, at getting to the, 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 the core issues that he represents, that, that, that Assange represents, and I think that was um, one of the film's great achievements. Yeah, I agree, and I, I definitely felt like, you know, that role of WikiLeaks as, you know, stepping in um, to release information. I mean, that whole story around, you know, Iceland and the public service broadcaster being gagged and actually putting WikiLeaks, the, the website, up on screen and saying, well, go and see the information here. The banksters need to be put on public trial and given the justice they deserve. More power to you, Iceland. There were some yeah. lovely stories in the film that really showed how WikiLeaks and Julian had kind of stepped into the breach where, you know, perhaps investigative journalism wasn't really uh, able to function in the way that maybe it should in a democracy. We were working on something that we knew that could get us all in very serious trouble and we were all willing to take that consequence. I think that all three of these films that we're discussing are really sort of snapshots of a very fast-moving modern history. The other two, probably more so than this one, in that I think that uh, We Still Secrets is, is specifically geared towards getting inside the man, Julian Assange, rather than a lot of his achievements. But um, it is an extraordinary point in, in, in modern history that these films uh, cover. I certainly felt that this was a film that, you know, if you wanted to really be informed about, you know, <laughs> the context of Julian's life and his work with WikiLeaks and, uh, you know, the history of that, that this was a good film to give you that information and a full background and, and you know, well researched, as you said. Well, I think Gibney's made a, a wonderful film. I don't think it's quite the, the polished or focused work that um, his Oscar winning film Taxi to the Dark Side was or even his last film, Mia Maxima Culpa, was. But um, if they were four, four and a half out of fives, this is a solid three and a half out of five. Thank you. There is a phenomenon called noble cause corruption. Essentially, you do things which, if anyone else did, you would recognise aren't OK, aren't right. But because you know you're a good guy, it's different for you. You don't need a shift to a totalitarian government. Big Brother doesn't have to show up looking as uh, the caricature of, of George Orwell at all. He's here now. That concerns me tremendously. Who, who the hell is this guy? Our next film is The Assange Agenda. The Assange Agenda is both a timely and provocative documentary from director Michael Weatherhead of One Planet Films. He's an irritant. He's profoundly an irritant. I don't like megalomaniacal people who are self-satisfied and sanctimonious, and that's what he is. I think he's doing something very important, and frankly, anyone who thinks 
this whole business is about uh, alleged low-level sex offences in Sweden. It just doesn't understand what's going on. It sets out to sort the wheat from the chaff around the WikiLeaks co-founder by asking, is this the agenda of transparency and civil rights, asking critical questions about surveillance? In the interests of our own transparency, I must point out here that the Assange Agenda is a documentary which I helped direct with Michael Weatherhead of One Planet Films in conjunction with Hotspots. Facebook has, for a very long time, implanted a little device that allows them to monitor the entire online footprint of any of their clients while they're being on Facebook and while they're off Facebook. Which means that Facebook not only has the history of what I do on Facebook while I'm on the Facebook site, no, it will know exactly which car I have rented, which holidays I've been booking on, which emails I've been sending, so on and so forth. And yet, at the same time, people happily and voluntarily share stuff out on Facebook, sign up to Facebook, knowing full well that this particular system is in place. So moving on to our second film, The Assange Agenda, and obviously I had quite a lot to do with making this film, Simon, so I think I should hand over to you to tell us what you thought of this. I'm enthused by this film because this looks um, at the broader consequences of Julian's uh, Assange's actions um, and those of the, the WikiLeaks organisation. The collection of talking heads and the way the information has been uh, collated and, and edited together is, is quite extraordinary. I should also point out that this is a film that's very much suited to broadcast TV or internet format. It moves along at a very, very zippy pace. What I found particularly fascinating uh, was that this is a film that adheres very closely uh, to the, the, the underpinning philosophical movement uh, of, the, of the, the WikiLeaks organization. I think it's, uh, it's about finding the truth. It's about uh, talking to people and exploring what people in very high places want to uh, say about the truth and getting the truth out there. And I think this film certainly speaks to, to that. This is a, a culture we live in which is very much driven by the, the cult of celebrity and the cult of personality. And I think that's what a lot of the news organizations uh, have focused on um, and not enough upon the issues. There were aspects of government surveillance um, and information swapping across continents that I was uh, completely struck by. This, this is a documentary that won't age at all. As I said previously, this is a, a really important snapshot of a point in history which is a turning point um, certainly for, for strong-willed activists and for, for those who want the truth out there, but people will come to realise this affects um, everyone across all of society, uh, across all nations. How much we, we actually have control over who gets to look at that information and how it's used does seem to be a key issue as we move further into the information age. Citizens are given away far more information to corporations than they ever have to governments. And indeed, you know, the way that NSA Prism X Keyscore and all these sorts of programs work is they tend to ask the big platforms, Facebook, Google, Twitter, these sorts of things, they have to ask them for the information more or less. Also uh, the phone information as well. So the corporations are already gathering all of this stuff because we give it to them. Privacy becomes ever harder to have uh, if it's not already lost. Is there a right to privacy? Uh, when I first saw Glenn Carl come on screen and, and what he was saying, I expected a very hard line approach from him, but his turning about towards the end saying, This is not the America I swore allegiance to, this is not. The, the, the shifting notion of democracy that I want to be want to be part of. I found that to be um, uh, some of the most compelling stuff in the film. He was an extraordinary personality. I, I found him in some ways to be the, the person who was giving us the, the strongest warning about needing to pay attention to, to what's going on with, with democracy and with surveillance because his level of concern about it having been an insider and, and really, a, you know, a very loyal insider to, to the CIA and the state of America, you know, 
uh, it was it was very compelling that that he's as anxious as he is about the situation. So you ask Americans 35 and above, should American officials, CIA officers, torture to protect American interests? A strong majority of Americans 35 and above say, absolutely not. That's not American. You ask Americans 35 and below the same question. Should American officials torture to protect American interests? And a majority of them say, guys like Carl, they have to do what they have to do. It's OK. What? That's America? That's not the America that I took an oath to live in. That's not the America that I am. That's horrifying. And that all has happened because of our response to the attacks of 9-11. We have a breaking news story to tell you about. Apparently, a plane has just crashed into the World Trade Center. One of the uh, sort of overriding themes that all these films that we're looking at today manages to put across is that the legacy of 9-11 and what it's meant to news gathering and the imparting of news to the general public and obviously the, the surveillance and the, the government technology that affects our lives on a daily basis has changed so much in the years since 9-11. And because it was unimaginable that something like this would have happened, also meant that now everyone working in the security sector would say, we need to imagine the unthinkable. And once this becomes your guiding principle, you can see how you can easily intrude further and further and start stripping away the types of civil liberties that have been very painfully fought over and installed over decades there. I was intrigued that there was no other film that really discussed what Assange was on about, and I felt like that was a gap that needed to be filled. I think one of the things that struck us is that the internet's changed the world forever, and we don't know quite where it's going to end up. And, you know, if it's true that, you know, the level of data collection is far worse than the Soviet Union or the Stasi in East Germany, we only need a few bad leaders or one or two bad leaders. And we could be in for some terrible times if that power is abused. And it's quite possible. Um, and that is why we have to take absolute care that this militarization of cyberspace, the militarization of civilian life, is kept as far as possible from Australia. Secrecy is something like forbidden fruit. You can't have it. It's classified. That makes you want it more. Our final film is Secrecy. Secrecy explores the tension between national security and corruption of power. Directed by Professor Peter Gallison and filmmaker Rob Moss, this film has found the perfect blend of informed fact, social commentary and activism. Using historical footage and expert interviews, the pair show the way secrecy has evolved since the Manhattan Project in the 1940s, where the race for the atomic bomb was a national need. The story of secrecy peaks at 9-11, when the film argues that the effect of not sharing information actually impeded the function of national security rather than serving it. But after 9-11, secrecy becomes the new mantra, and the start of the surveillance state begins in earnest. Homeland Security is born, and government data centers start springing up across the USA to monitor all internet and communications. The current zeitgeist of total global surveillance, NSA leaks, and information warfare can thus be seen to have its origins here at Ground Zero. I was down very close to the towers when the second one collapsed. I looked down at my notebook and I knew I was supposed to write something because that's what I do and I just wrote gone and words failed for a while but soon after that we realized that we were in a new world and a new situation. What did you make of this one Simon? 
although it's only quite short, only just over an hour long, it was a, a film that certainly captured a lot of the historical perspectives of government surveillance and of, of government information collection, whereas the other films had very a, a real sense of immediacy about them, or a sense of here and now. This documentary, which was made in 2008, which, which, but which certainly seems... Um, as current, even more current now than, than maybe when it came out. It seems like a very uh, prescient piece of filmmaking. Sure. I mean, the reasoning and, in fact, the legality in America, I, I was astonished that, you know, the precedent for uh, the American Secret Services being able to say, well, you know, this threatens national security. We don't have to prove that. We, we just have to say it might threaten national security security, that, that that precedent was set in the 50s you know, and that that has been repeated you know, over 600 times since then to, to, to guard secrets with really no justification. It was so murky back in the 50s. Those were troubling times. The Cold War threatened to ignite at any moment. We had so many things to fear. I think in the film it's referred to as the paradigm of the Cold War, where we knew where the boundaries were, we knew uh, what the enemy was up to, more or less. But in this in this modern day and age, post 9/11, where we're engaged in a war that is constantly shifting the rules, constantly shifting the the playing field, and that has eaten into uh, some very crucial democratic ideals upon which the great democracies of the world have been formed and have been based. Even after 9-11, there are lines over which you don't go, even in self-defense. So the secrecy enabled a kind of takeover of legal precedent and a rule. That's where a number of the, the, the talking heads in these documentaries say that exactly what are we fighting to protect? We're continually chipping away at the very principles that set the country up, that, that, are, that, are, that have got us all revved up and got us fighting in the first place, but they're becoming diluted more and more as, as time goes along. And it was a, that's a very eye-opening, I think, perspective. You don't kill civilians. There are rules for how you treat prisoners. You don't use WMD. Now, we as a country have broken those rules, but at our peril, because those rules fundamentally protect us more than they protect anybody else. Yeah, I really enjoyed that black and white animation as well. And the music as well in this film, I really, I felt was very atmospheric and beautiful. I think for its, you know, the information, the history, the context, kind of how did we get here? That's, that's the question that this film for me really provides some solid information in answer of. Democracy begins with this very simple idea. It's all of us. We're all responsible. We get the country we deserve. Because we chose it. The, the fact that secrecy is intimately related to power means that I think that democratic nations, as power brokers, are not actually interested in this. And you have to kind of force them into this new age because they wouldn't do it willingly because it means giving up some kind of power. I think every, every administration of every country in the last hundred years has found that when you have secrets, people can't participate in what you decide. And in that sense, I very much agree with Rob that secrecy withholds power from other people. If the courts don't know what's being decided, they can't act. If the legislatures don't know what's being decided, they can't legislate. If the press doesn't know about it, they can't make things public. If the public doesn't know about it, they can't make decisions about democratic deliberation. So secrecy is about power. And the question is then, what kind of secrets are legitimate secrets? And where are they being used to protect turf or to guard power for illegitimate reasons? 
Well, that's the latest on the issue of surveillance and democracy. Watch the films for a deeper perspective on these issues and decide for yourself what you believe should happen next. I'm Lucy Rhodes and I'm wishing you and democracy all the best, wherever you may be in the world. Thank you.